practice. Good morning, Isha from the Philippines. Uh, today, we're going to discuss about the uh, Middle East and uh, North African region, uh, including the South Asia uh, in the, uh, the current uh, pandemic right now. Uh, we have with us uh, an award-winning um, journalist, geopolitical analyst, and presenter, Mr. Malik Ayub. Uh, how are you? Good morning, uh, Malik. Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Right, right. So let's begin with our uh, conversation here. Um, Governments in the MENA and South Asian uh, region have rapidly uh, uh, reacted to the um, containment of the COVID-19 uh, with uh, contagion seems uh, limited and the public uh, health consequences uh, have uh, less uh, than expected. So how, um, however, coronavirus pandemic uh, is already uh, causing traumatic and social consequences in the region. So how MENA and South Asian can we address these uh, structural imbalances and support design of uh, these two inclusive uh, growth model? Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me in your, this podcast. And uh, so the situation right now into the Middle East and to, into the South Asia is so like uh, is alarming because of this pandemic and uh, especially the South Asian region because the country, the South Asia is one of the dense population populated area. It's like huge population and uh, the development sectors uh, you know, of these countries is not much good as compared to the uh, Western European countries or some uh, far Eastern countries. So uh, I think that uh, it's going to be something like very disastrous into this uh, region because uh, of the lack of resources and of uh, not uh, good management how to tackle this crisis. Similarly, into the Middle East region, because that is totally uh, majority of the Middle Eastern countries have faced uh, the deadliest war. Uh, so most of the uh, these countries' infrastructure has been totally demolished, and uh, in this case, it's really something like disastrous to be uh, control and to tackle this uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, because of the humanitarian crisis into these countries, one of the uh, major crises was the refugees crisis after the mm. Arab Spring. So uh, you can say that yeah. uh, it's, it's going to be something like a big challenge for these countries uh, to control the spread of this uh, coronavirus. Yes. Right, right. But, but how do you uh, balance now um, the, the fight between... Um, economy and uh, public health so far in those regions, uh, uh, there were reports that uh, the, 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 in terms of a uh, public health uh, system in those regions, uh, a little, uh, these are, uh, they are a little bit uh, weak compared to other uh, regions so far. And then uh, the economy is on contracting. So how do you weigh all these options here? Uh, unfortunately, the public health system into these countries is not as upgraded and uh, it's not like the very uh, something like uh, a uh, high standard uh, that could um, that could be controlled the uh, the thrash of this disease, but uh, it's also interrelated to the economy of these countries because uh, these countries don't uh, don't have uh, a capability to to do, to go for a long lockdown. Uh, some countries, you say, like India, Pakistan, these countries uh, have opened the lockdown, and uh, you can see that. Uh, how alarming they are going toward the uh, spread of this disease. Uh, so economy is, of course, interrelated to this uh, all this uh, scenario because uh, most of the economy, or economy, especially the business sectors, uh, uh, they are going to be at the verge of the collapse because, uh, because of this disease, uh, the supply chain and the flow of the uh, various goods is disconnected. And uh, some uh, some cartels, uh, some hoarders, uh, so they are getting some benefits. But uh, overall, the picture of the economy is uh, very bad, and it could have a very long-lasting effects of the economies of these countries into the Middle East and South Asia. Right. Yeah, uh, let's talk about the uh, the perception that uh, China has uh, significantly increased its uh, economic, political, and uh, to a lesser extent its uh, security footprint in the the Middle East and South Asian region. So, 
Well, what are the views of uh, the people um, in those regions, uh, particularly with the tight competition between the U.S. and China? Uh, I think that uh, I should pass this question. I'm not much expert about the uh, such kind <laughs> right, of stuff. right. Yeah, so I, I would I would better but, but, to pass this question. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, but 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 generally, uh, in pre-pandemic, uh, optimists are saying that uh, it's going to be an Asian century. And uh, how do you view with this one, given that uh, you know uh, uh, the the volatility of security architecture and the economic resiliency in South Asia and in the MENA region? So. Uh, how are they coping up so far with this kind of uh, perspective? I think that these two, these two are totally different subjects, like the security issue and the pandemic. I think they are not; they could not be interrelated in their, this scenario because uh, the countries, mostly the countries who are like into the Middle East and to, into the South Asia, they are fighting this uh, this crisis. But uh, you cannot uh, interrelate directly. May, maybe there are some some connections between this, but not at this stage. Like uh, you cannot say that. Uh, 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 because Middle East is a country like they have the mostly the Middle East is one of the region that is uh, occupied and that have been uh, uh, well controlled by the by the by the Western allies. So uh, right. there is already something like going on a big confrontation confrontation between the Russia and United States, like in Syria, you can say. Uh, so now the Libya is going to be a next front. So, but the pandemic is something like uh, you cannot interrelate directly with uh, these two issues. Like the, the, I think that they, that is totally separate issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, how would you relate the relationship of um, South Asia and the uh, MENA regions here? Why they are interconnected? Uh, they are also independent with each other when it comes to their economic activities and people-to-people uh, -people engagement. So can you visualize and share some of your experiences why these regions do matter to us? Can you repeat your question again? I didn't, hear, I didn't get your right, question. Right, right. Uh, we're talking about the MENA here, uh, the interrelationship uh, between uh, South Asia and the MENA regions, right? And uh, how important is this kind of relationship, why they are, they need each other so far economically speaking and uh, for people to people engagements. So how would you describe the relationship between uh, South Asia and the um, Middle East and North, North African regions? Yeah, so the Middle Eastern countries, uh, like uh, you can say they're the GCC, that the Gulf Cooperation uh, Countries Cooperation, that is a country, that is a region where there is a lot of like experts uh, from the South Asia, like India and Pakistan, like a huge number of the people, they are working uh, into these countries, like in Dubai and Abu Dhabi and uh, in Saudi Arabia. So uh, uh, these GCC countries have a very direct influence onto these countries like India and Pakistan. Like you can say that uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, and these countries have a lot of a uh, lot of lot of uh, hold, you can say, uh, um, uh, in, even in Pakistan, like uh, the GCC countries have a lot of uh, lot of hold. They can involve into their domestic politics. They can uh, uh, sometimes when there is a dispute between the India and Pakistan, uh, they intervene into this kind of uh, mediation. So the Middle Eastern countries, uh, especially GCC, have a very strong role. And uh, mostly you can say that uh, in their security sector, uh, mostly the people who are serving, uh, especially the, uh, the lower rank soldiers, they, they're from Pakistan. Uh, like in Bahrain, uh, there's a lot of uh, Pakistanis who are serving in their militaries. They have been uh, recruited from Pakistan and then they will be serving there. Similarly into the uh, United Arab Emirates. So uh, these countries have, uh, direct economic and uh, the security cooperation behind the scene. And uh, if you can say that uh, the economic perspective, so there is a huge uh, foreign remittance uh, that has been sent by the employees who are working right. into the GPC countries to Pakistan. Similarly in India, in Bangladesh, uh, in uh, Nepal. So these countries uh, have a lot of uh, employees who are working into the uh, these countries. So there is a very direct relation between the uh, Middle Eastern countries, GCC, and the South Asian countries. Okay, let's talk about the air travel and tourism in, in uh, particularly in the Middle East, because uh, we're talking about here of uh, Dubai as a hub, 
including uh, Qatar. I mean, uh, what would happen uh, to, to, to these countries uh, who rely so much with, uh, with, with tourism and um, with the airline industry? So what are your prognostics about this? I think it's uh, their uh, tourism sector has a very bad setback, not only mm. the Middle Eastern countries, almost every country, but uh, as these countries are very small and uh, mostly their, uh, their, their economy is dependent on to the tourism are some natural resources. So they are really, uh, uh, they are facing uh, one of the most uh, effects of this coronavirus. Uh, so I just want to give you an example of the Saudi Arabia, because they have a huge revenue after the oil uh, the country has been getting the uh, they're getting the revenue from the uh, from the Hajj pilgrims and to the Mecca pilgrims about this uh, Umrah. So you can say that like for the last couple of months it's been uh, it's been banned, and now they are considering to uh, cancel one of the largest uh, uh, gathering of the Muslims that is the Hajj. So they are considering it. If it's gonna be cancelled, I think they can be faced like a big big financial loss. Mm. So, uh, not only this uh, Hajj, because the Hajj and these pilgrims, pilgrimages is interrelated with a lot of uh, other businesses like the hotel industry, like uh, a lot of businesses are directly involved uh, into this, right. uh, all this system. Yeah. So, similarly, into the, the Dubai and all these countries, so uh, there's no tourism going on right now. And uh, their, their, their economies are really suffering a, a, very, a very big loss. So if it's gonna be a couple of more months, so I think it would be like very much, uh, uh, it could be very uh, disastrous for their economies. And right, uh, right. This, if it Hajj is going to be canceled, because this is something like uh, a very, very big loss for the Saudis who have who have already, you can say that like they have already made make a major cuts. They put heavy taxes on the people uh, because the Saudi Arabia is a country which is not have like uh, huge taxes on the people. So now they have started the value added taxes. They are starting different kind of the taxes and even their uh, vision 2030 of the uh, Saudi crown prince, it's also badly uh, affected and they are going to cut uh, various projects. Right, right. So how will uh, these countries, uh, especially uh, for the MENA region, uh, how will they reset their economy if yeah, that uh, we are entering the uh, industry 4.0, the uh, for the dashboard revolution caused by the pandemic. Uh, now uh, has become the put it to fast speed now. It's a big challenge, actually. It's a very big mm. challenge for them because uh, because these, uh, as I mentioned again, that these countries are very tiny. Uh, these countries mm. are not like the big countries, and uh, uh, they don't have any much resources. Like they don't have the agriculture. They don't have the any other alternative sources of the revenue okay. generation mostly that Dubai is like one of the big you can say that there are uh, there is a stopover the people mm -hmm. all around the world they come they, they they stay they they spend some money and then they go away similarly like the big exhibitions like the Dubai is the country who is earning a very big amount of revenue from the various kind of the show uh, showcasing of the various uh, um, international workshops seminars and other exhibitions so it's almost stopped now because there is no not going anything uh, exhibitions conferences seminars all these are the very negative signs of their economy and uh, it could be a big challenge for these countries if this disease lasts uh, like uh, right. like a couple of months more so they could have to be uh, i think face very uh, severe challenges uh, into the recent years Right, right. Uh, maybe for um, the last point that I would like to ask from you is that uh, given all these um, 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 baseline uh, issues when it comes to economic resiliency in the, the MENA and the South Asian region, so uh, what is the future of this region uh, in terms of other uh, economy, in terms of other uh, political cooperation and uh, security uh, um, set? set up in the region. So what do you see there? It's very unclear. Uh, it's unpredictable at this stage, but the, the, but, the, but, the, but the gestures, the overall sign is very alarming. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm, not much, I'm not much optimistic, you can say, that under the current prevailing conditions, I think that uh, it's, 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 it's one of the biggest challenges into the recent, uh, recent years. Uh, 
because this country's history, like the Middle East, is not like you can say like the many years. It, it, it was just like a couple of like you can say that they are facing, they are they are at this economic boom very recently mm -hmm. uh, after the mm -hmm. creation of the GCC and all this uh, Saudi Arabian countries. Uh, so they don't have a very uh, long, uh, they have a very long history, but uh, that economic boom is not like uh, historical. You cannot say that like Dubai and Abu Dhabi and all this region was uh, um, uh, was very much uh, into the critical condition. If you go back into the 70 year, 80 year before, uh, their economic condition uh, was very bad and it was totally a desert. So this oh. sky structures we can see very recently after the after the boom of this oil industry. Mm -hmm. so, so I can see that uh, if these countries don't have any alternative of their economy, uh, it may be going to be again uh, towards that uh, reverse direction, I am feared. So they must have to come up with something like alternative sources of the revenue. Otherwise, it's going to be something like uh, much disasters for their economy and even all for their people. Right, right. So, mean, say this is the uh, the, the last Hades of uh, the Middle East uh, prosperity when it comes to uh, to, to, to their oil and um, other means of prosperity. So it's like the it's like it's like a, a, an end for everything for them. No, you cannot say it's going to be something like end for them, but uh, it's going to be something like uh, because they have uh, they have built their infrastructure, they will definitely. Uh, do some alternative uh, options mm -hmm. to tackle these and challenges. And we know what are these alternative options that uh, they are planning so far? Uh, I'm not sure what, what, what they have, but of course mm -hmm. they should have some sort of the alternative options mm -hmm. to uh, to get some some new uh, right. sources. Right. Of yeah, because yeah. they are moving very fastly towards the digitalization. They are uh, making some uh, some new power generation techniques. So of course they have, but again, these countries have not like uh, something like the very huge, huge potential. They are very small. They are very mm -hmm. small. They were designed according to the previous uh, world order. They were, uh, they were tackling according to the, uh, the according to the previous, uh, previous uh, needs of the countries. So now what's going to be next? uh it's unpredictable that how right, life right. will be yeah yeah after the after because the pre and the post pandemic uh, world have a lot of uh, differences so let's see what's coming up next after the end of this disease but but, but what can the south africa uh, south asia can offer also uh, once the reset their economy in post pandemic period south asian countries actually have uh, a different kind of the problem because they, their their economies are not like the oil driven economies. Right, they have right. different sources of the revenue generation. Like if you, I will give you the example of the Pakistan. So they have different kind of the economy generation. They have the agriculture sector. They have, but now the agriculture is also facing one of the worst loss because the Pakistan mango that that is one of the best mangoes in the world and that's export. Mm. So this year. The, uh, their mangoes is not going to be exported and they are facing like the huge losses. So similarly, they have their own kind of challenges. So for which they have to tackle and it's even more, more difficult for them as compared to the Middle Eastern countries. For the South Asian countries, it's more difficult to come up all these challenges because they are their biggest challenges, their dense populated areas. They have a huge population. And then when they have the huge population, they have the lack of the public health facilities. So this is like something like directly interrelated with them. So they're going to be something like face more severe time in this uh, pandemic. And after the pandemic, how they will stand, it's going to be something like another big challenge for them. That is not going to be very easy for them to, to come up all this uh, scenario. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Malika, for your uh, oh, you're welcome. informative you're welcome. insights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.